Firstly, let me thank Dr. Chidlow for inviting me to speak on this topic. My topic is minimally invasive surgery in gynecology, and I'm going to concentrate on this topic in Malaysia. I have no disclosure. Now, this is my lecture outline. Firstly, I'll be talking about the types of minimally invasive surgery available to gynecologists. Next, I will talk about the types of laparoscopic surgeries performed by gynecologists. I'll then move on to types of hysteroscopic surgeries performed by gynecologists. I will briefly talk about my journey uh, in minimally invasive surgery in Malaysia. Next, I will talk about who is promoting MIS to gynecologists in Malaysia. Next, why is MIS not so popular in Malaysia? And lastly, I'll, I'll just conclude uh, my lecture. The first topic is what are the types of minimally invasive surgeries performed by gynecologists in Malaysia? Basically, we do laparoscopic surgery. There is a traditional laparoscopic surgery which involves three or four small incisions in the abdomen. Next is we also do hysteroscopic surgeries. This is also uh, not as big as laparoscopic surgery, but it is also a part of surgeries that gynecologists perform. The other uh, surgery is single incision laparoscopic surgery. This is a bit more technically difficult and not many doctors in Malaysia actually do single incision laparoscopic surgery. And lastly, the new uh, surgery is V-node surgery. is a vaginal natural orifices transendoscopic surgery. And we usually do it transvaginally. And uh, the surgery that is commonly done is this, is uh, V-node hysterectomy. Although there are people doing other uh, operations like V-node myomectomy. I will concentrate on these two topics, which is laparoscopic surgery and hysteroscopic surgery. And I will not touch on single incision laparoscopic surgery and v nodes. Now, there are many surgeries uh, that can be done for, for benign pathology. We all started off doing diagnostic laparoscopy. In, uh, in those days, when I was training in 1988, we didn't have uh, cameras. So we would look into the uh, telescope to look into the abdomen uh, for diagnosis. And usually diagnostic laparoscopy was done for diagnosing ectopic pregnancies and also to look for uh, tubal patency. Uh, then is tubal ligation, another simple operation that is performed in those days by looking into the camera, but uh, it can be done now with the video laparoscopy. The other entry level uh, surgeries are ectopic pregnancies for tubal diseases, sulfingectomy, sulfingolysis, and fibroplasty is a slightly more advanced surgery. We can also perform surgeries for benign ovarian cysts like dermoid cysts, para ovarian cysts, and follicular cysts. Then comes the more uh, advanced surgeries like myomectomy for fibroids, a common surgery that is performed. And of course, hysterectomy is the probably the gold standard surgery for laparoscopy, laparoscopic surgeries. And it can be done for many reasons, including fibroids, endometriosis, menorrhagia, and so on. Uh, probably the best way of treating endometriosis is by laparoscopic surgery. This is a bit more advanced surgery. Uh, it, it, will, it will require a lot of technical skills to perform a good surgery for endometriosis. Then there is the more fancy surgeries like sacrocorpopexy for prolapse surgeries. Of course, there are other surgeries that we can do, but this is generally the common types of laparoscopic surgery performed by gynecologists throughout the world. Now, what about malignancy? Laparoscopy can be performed for can gynecological cancers. It can be done for staging just to take biopsies, look at the pelvis. It can be done for endometrial cancer. I think this is gold standard now. Um, surgery, laparoscopic surgery for endometrial cancer, which includes radical hysterectomy or just uh, uh, hysterectomy plus pelvic lymphadenectomy. Uh, cancer of the cervix, it was very, very popular until the LAC trial where they showed that uh, laparoscopic surgery is probably inferior to open surgery. So now not many people do uh, radical surgery laparoscopically for cancer of the cer cervix, especially the larger cancer of the cervix. It can be also done for early ovarian cancer, although this is quite controversial. Now, what about hysteroscopic surgery? Now, we can perform hysteroscopies uh, for diagnostic purposes to look at the cavity, to look at whether there's any adhesions or anything, any small polyps. We can, we can remove polyps by the hysteroscopy. We can cut septums and uh, uh, correct the uterine cavity. We can do adhesiolysis and also uh, transcervical resection of fibroids. It's a popular surgery. Uh, for gynecologists uh, uh, with, uh, in patients with submucous fibroids. 
Now, next, I will just talk about my experience becoming a laparoscopic surgeon in Malaysia. Now, I started my training in laparoscopic surgery at the Changan Memorial Hospital uh, in 1994. At that time, not many people were doing laparoscopic surgery in Malaysia, so I went there to get my initial training. I was with Professor Song and uh, stayed there for two months, intensively uh, assisting and performing laparoscopic surgery. So when I came back, I was in uh, Makuta Medical Center and we started performing laparoscopic surgery in Makuta Medical Center. And between 1994 and 2006, I attended many simple workshops uh, on laparoscopic surgery, trying to improve my skills in uh, this uh, technology. In 2003, I organized the uh, International Society of Gynae Endoscopic Annual Conference, where I met a lot of uh, world leaders. And from then, uh, I went to these places to, to learn from all these uh, leaders in uh, laparoscopic surgery in the world. Between 2000 and two, 2006 and 2018, I started organizing my own workshops, many different types of workshops. And I learned a lot from organizing and assisting uh, laparoscopic surgeons in, from different parts of the world at these workshops. In two, also between 2011 and 2019, I also attended a lot of workshops and conferences uh, overseas uh, to try to improve my skills in minimally invasive surgery. In 2014, I organized the APH, which is the Asia Pacific Association of Gynae Endoscopic Annual Conference here in Kuala Lumpur, and then became the president of APH, another avenue for which I had the opportunity of meeting and learning from people who are doing a lot of laparoscopic surgery. In 2011, I visited uh, Dr. Masaki Andu's center in Kurashiki, Japan, and stayed there for 10 days, learning from him all his skills just by observing his surgeries. In 2012, I visited Dr. Silesh Puntambaka's uh, center in Pune, India for seven days. Here, I, I not only watched him operating, I also assisted him to learn about uh, how to do radical hysterectomy, the Pune technique. In 2016, I visited Professor Zhang Zhu, a urologist in Beijing for two days and watched him operating, uh, performing robotic and laparoscopic surgery in urology. So kind of gives me an idea of how a urologist performed laparoscopic surgery. And in 2018, I visited Dr. Deepak in Ahmedabad for two days. Again, this is a very good laparoscopic surgeon for cancers and I learned a lot from him. So these are some of the photographs taken during all these visits. This is Professor Masaki Andu, and this is his assistant, Professor Kanao, who is also a very brilliant laparoscopic surgeon. Here I'm with Professor Nam, who is operating in Mlaka GH. And this is Dr. Vijay. And uh, here is my visit to Beijing with Professor Zhang Wu uh, in his center. And here I'm operating with uh, Professor Anud Bates at the Makuta Medical Center, where he, he came and performed a few cases uh, in a workshop. And here is a late Dr. Rakesh Sinha, also operating in uh, Hospital Malacca, where he came to show us how to do uh, laparoscopic surgery for big uteruses. And after that, I also uh, started performing some advanced work. In 2012, I started performing single incision laparoscopic surgery. In 2016, I started 3D laparoscopy. And, and since then, I have been addicted to performing laparoscopy in, in 3D. And in 2019, I started V-notes uh, laparoscopic V-notes surgery. In this year, I started uh, HIFU, which is high intensity focused ultrasound. This is, this is not laparoscopic surgery, but non-invasive surgery for fibroids and adenomyosis. So this is my experience performing laparoscopic surgery in the last 28 years. I started laparoscopic surgery after coming back from, from Taiwan in 1994. And on that, in that year, in a few months, I did 16 cases. And since then, my numbers have, have gone up. Uh, between 2004 and, two, and 2019, I was performing an average of about 250 to 300 uh, cases of laparoscopy per year. Of course, these last two years, is, the numbers have come down because of the pandemic. In, in my practice, um, almost 95% of benign gynecology will be performed by laparoscopy. So it is a proof that we gynecologists can perform a majority of our gynecological cases by laparoscopy. But unfortunately, this is not the norm in Malaysia. Uh, in Malaysia, the, I think the uptake of laparoscopic surgery uh, by gynecologists is probably about 10 to 20 percent probably and, uh, the, and there are many reasons for it which I will discuss in a little while. 
So this is also my statistics up to in the last 28 years, I've performed 6,483 laparoscopic surgeries, about 400 hysteroscopic surgeries. This does not include diagnostic uh, hysteroscopy. Diagnostic hysteroscopy, I, I, I perform it routinely. I've performed about 3,000 diagnostic hysteroscopies. Single incision laparoscopic surgery, 320, V-notes, 47, I'm trying to develop this V-notes technique. And HIFU, uh, over the last five and a half months, we have done 97 cases. So now who is promoting MIS uh, to gynecologists in Malaysia? The Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Malaysia, of course, uh, are the pioneers. And I, I was a past president of the OGSM. And, and for the last uh, eight, nine years, I was the chairman of the endoscopic subcommittee chairman aiming at promoting minimally invasive surgery in Malaysia. I just gave up the chairmanship to Dr. Sharifa this year. Uh, also, uh, the Gynecological Endoscopic Society of Malaysia, this is a GSM, has been, uh, has been formed in the last four or five years. Its president is uh, Dr. Hazim, and uh, they are doing a very good job. I'm an advisor for them. And uh, the GESM is actually formulating a fellowship and kind of a accreditation for uh, uh, gynecologists to be called as a uh, laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgeon. And they are working with the Academy of Medicine to come up with some kind of guidelines for this. Because there are no places in Malaysia to train in minimally invasive surgery, except for probably Putrajaya and uh, previously uh, in uh, Sungai Patani with Dr. Kuna, I started a fellowship in minimally invasive surgery and fertility, especially for private doctors who want to learn laparoscopic surgeries. So they usually come to me and stay with me for three months to one year, uh, learning how to do uh, minimally invasive surgery from me at no cost. I don't charge them anything. It's just they have to take their time off to come to my operating theater. And I've, at the moment, already trained about eight doctors in this fellowship. There were some, there were two doctors who stayed with me for one year, the rest are for three months to six months. The other training is the ABGAT, which is the Asia Pacific Gynecological Endoscopic Training Group, ABGAT, which is a, a society, a group that is formed about four years ago. It's a group of uh, gynecologists in different parts of Asia. And uh, we also provide uh, workshops. Uh, we organize four workshops in a year. And uh, uh, Malaysians are also invited to join this training group. And I think uh, the, the uptake of this training by Malaysians is very high. For the advantage of ABGAT is everything is paid for. You're paid for travel, stay, and also the training is paid for uh, when you get uh, when successfully enroll in this uh, program, ABGAT program. Now, my next question, my next uh, topic is why is MIS not so popular in Malaysia among gynecologists? These are probably the reasons why it is not uh, very popular. Firstly, the training in public, public and university hospitals is difficult as there are not many teachers trained in MIS. The workload is heavy in these hospitals. Uh, so because it's this uh, private and public hospitals are very heavy on obstetrics workload, uh, gynecology is put on the sideline and, uh, and, and also the, the doctors are not doing it and so they don't train their, um, their younger doctors to do uh, minimally invasive surgery. I, many of the young specialists in, uh, in uh, university hospitals and public hospitals are very keen on many MIS, but they're not getting the cases and not getting teaching in MIS. I think this is one big problem. The other problem is also hospitals are not very well equipped with MIS equipment and constantly complain, especially if there are not good assistance. When you're not doing a certain procedure, often you don't get good uh, assistance and, uh, and that makes the whole process much more difficult. The other reason why it's not pop popular is especially in private practice is there's no incentive to do MIS in private practice as the remuneration is not good. Whether you perform an MIS or open surgery, the, the code and the fee is the same. I think you, many of you all know this. For example, the code for a hysterectomy, whether it's done open, vaginal, laparoscopic, or v notes is the same, which is 2040 ringgit. And the fees for a caesarean section is also 2040. So most gynecologists who actually are busy obstetricians prefer to, uh, to open this open surgery and can spend their time delivering babies. I think this is probably the most important reason why MIS is not popular among uh, private practitioners in Malaysia. 
Another reason is that the public is not very well informed about the benefits of MIS. They listen to the obstetrician and just undergo open surgery. Since they're busy obstetrician, do not want to have the time or interest to learn MIS surgery. Because of this problem, I actually published a book called Laparoscopic Surgery in Gynecology and Common Diseases to educate the public about the benefits of laparoscopic surgery so that they will actually pressure the their doctors to do uh, minimally invasive surgery or refer them to someone who does minimally invasive surgery. This is the only way that we can push uh, obstetricians to learn MIS. So in conclusion, progress in adoption of MIS among Malaysian gynecologists is very slow. It is going to be worse in the future since there are too many doctors in the government service and even less chance to practice MIS. We need more teachers in MIS in gynecologists to teach young doctors minimally invasive surgery. I feel that obstetrics should be separated from gynecology so that those who do gynecology can concentrate and on perfecting the art of minimally invasive surgery. Thank you.